I never thought I'd get to say this sentence in a video, but I can't believe that the horse got cucked by a human. <laughs> what the f I'm kidding, but this one scene in Spirit definitely looks like it. Now that I have hopefully gotten your attention and perhaps even a slight giggle, let me introduce you to one of DreamWorks' best films, which is a bold claim to make since when DreamWorks hits it out of the park, they hit that sucker into the next universe. Hit it! <laughs> Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, was released in 2002 and was probably the most watched movie Little Baby Cameron watched. I liked it so much that my third birthday party was Spirit themed. Thankfully, it's one of the few childhood films that actually still holds up, which is something I can't say for another DreamWorks movie that deserves to be burnt to a crisp. You dig, dog? Dig! Dog. Dog dig. Dig dog. Yeah. Yo, diggy dog! So what did this film do in order to garner such high praise for me? Well, a lot. For starters, the animation in this is absolutely gorgeous. The backgrounds are all painted on and really capture the beauty and majesty of western United States with many shots being inspired by Glacier National Park as well as Yellowstone National Park. Which now gives me an excuse to use footage and photos I've taken from my most recent Yellowstone trip. The animation of the movement is incredibly fluid and satisfying to watch, from the horses running to the hair in their manes flowing in the wind, or with every little movement they make. Now it should be pointed out that in certain shots CGI was used instead of hand drawn, with most of it being done for large groups whether it's the horses running, the bison at the lake, or even shots of humans. Despite the CGI being 2002, and while it's more noticeable in some shots than others, overall it's fairly well integrated into the artwork. It was most likely done to save money on having to hand draw large groups, which is understandable since it's pretty much done exclusively to background characters. I do believe that the most impressive part of the animation is the facial expressions. This movie makes the very bold choice to have practically no dialogue from the horses, with the only exception being the occasional inner monologue, which is the voice of Matt Damon. And so I grew from colt to stallion, as wild and reckless as thunder over the land. Because of that, the facial expressions have to be on point, otherwise the audiences will be confused. Thankfully, the animators did a great job. If they removed a few lines of inner monologue, you would still be able to tell exactly what the horses are thinking, because the facial expressions are just that damn good. While on the topic of the inner monologue, I must say for an animated family movie, it was ballsy to go with no dialogue from the animals and not having any sort of comic relief character. The lack of dialogue is refreshing for an animated movie because it instead relies on visual storytelling, you know that thing that movies and TV shows exist for. Insert joke about how so many films overexposit everything in their story instead of coming up with creative ways to convey the narrative to said audience. For example, this film takes place over a prolonged period of time with the best way to see this is Spirit's hair length as it grows as he's in the Lakota tribe. The characters in this film are also pretty good. It helps that the expressive animation shows the viewers how much personality everyone has. First we got Little Creek, and that's his name in the movie, so that's what I'm going to refer to him as, so please don't torch me Twitter. Oh yeah, Twitter can't, because Big Daddy Elon Bucks is torching the platform down, causing everyone to freak out. It's about damn time. Little Creek is the boy from the Lakota tribe that befriends Spirit and the relationship between him and Spirit is probably the main heart of this film with him eventually being able to ride Spirit as they both have to fight in order to win their freedom and to protect the ones they love. He also acts like a teenager and by that I mean he's definitely goofy and likes to play around and has a connection to nature. <laughs> But overall, as a character, and I will only speak as a character, but in the story he is written as just a solid all-around person. The fact that he isn't some kind of goofy comic relief character, or god forbid a Disney interpretation of indigenous Americans, is already a bonus point for him. And at least from my own research, it does appear the film does treat the Lakota tribe with respect, with it being semi-accurate. However, this is in reference to how the Lakota were in the 19th century, which is when this film takes place. I cannot and will not speak for the accuracy of modern day representation. If anyone is part of the Lakota tribe and has more information on the manor, comment below because I'm definitely interested to see how accurate this film is. Next, a significant character we have is Rain, the love interest, which I referred to in my opening joke. Out of all the significant characters, she's probably the most bland, but even then she still has some kind of personality, with her trolling spirit as well as her being conflicted about leaving Little Creek in the life that she has known to join spirit and his herd. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Next, we have our other human character, the Colonel. The Colonel is honestly a pretty solid antagonist. While he's definitely a do things officially type of guy, he is also willing to take things into his own hands when necessary. Good. Fetch my crop and spurs. His treatment of Little Creek is also very interesting. Ah, a Lakota. Not as tall as the Cheyenne, not as fine featured as the Crow. Take him away, gentlemen. Show him our best. The fact that he actually refers to him to a specific tribe, as well as knowing the differences between the tribes in the area, shows that he does treat his enemy, quote unquote, seriously and doesn't just result in throwing out racial slurs or insults. I mean, he does throw out insults. But, but here's the thing. I believe it was in Criminal Minds that they said something similar to this. And not to respect the people I hunt would be like a soldier not respecting his enemy. And that mistake costs lives. I guess a more recent and probably popular example is Thanos with his respect for Tony. <sighs> yeah, my respect's dark. When I'm done, half of humanity will still be alive. In the end, after the final chase, he even acknowledges and respects Little Creek and Spirit after they escape, showing that he is a man that will fully acknowledge the abilities of his opponents and what they are capable of. I always appreciate it when the protagonist and antagonist have this mutual respect for one another. I think it's more interesting than just the standard good guy versus bad guy, although there's nothing wrong with that. Now we move on to the main stallion of the film, Spirit. One cool fact is how a large chunk of his personality is reflective of the role stallions play in herds in real life, with them often being the guard from dangers by putting themselves in harm's way to protect the rest of the herd. The instinct to protect others is the defining trait. It's not his only one, with others including curiosity, being a leader, cockiness, playfulness, and an unbroken spirit. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! To elaborate on his relationship between Little Creek and him, it's very interesting to see spirits so distrusting of humans, which, you know, is a fair thing considering, well, that was the reason he was taken from his home in the first place. Little Creek even realizes that no matter how friendly Spirit will be, he will never ride him, and releases him. Now due to circumstances, and after being captured again, Little Creek saves him and is finally able to ride Spirit in a moment that feels earned and properly set up. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little teary-eyed when they said goodbye. I will miss you, my friend. Are you crying? No. The musical score in this film is awesome. It gives the movie this grand scale that the western landscape is known for, and whether it's a playful moment or a sad one, the music always is there to elevate it. Now this movie is kind of like a musical, allow me to explain. It takes a similar approach to Tarzan and Brother Bear, aka the Phil Collins jukebox musicals. And I'm gonna say it, but before I do, I want to remind everyone that we are calm and reasonable adults. And I can't stress this enough about you all not getting mad at me, but this film implements songs into the story better than Tarzan or Brother Bear. Okay, I had that coming. Calm down, calm down everyone, I, just, just let me explain myself. In this film, the animals don't talk, and so the songs are essentially another form of inner monologue of how a particular character feels, which is one of the main reasons to do a musical, to express the character's feelings. That's not the only reason, but it usually is a major reason. This works because the animals aren't talking. Whether you like the songs or not, that's up to you, but how this film uses its songs is just flat out better. Now compare this to Brother Bear. Tarzan still has this problem, however it's not to such a drastic extent. With these films, it feels like we get these good scenes of dialogue cut out because we have to have Phyllis Collins just singing in the background of the scene. With the worst example of this scene from Brother Bear. Mostly it's about a monster. A monster who did something so bad. Everywhere I turn, I hurt someone. Oh, shut up. 
It's when Kenai tells Koda he killed his mom. Well, that's what's supposed to happen, but we get this really obnoxious Phil Collins song singing about how these characters are sad. Like, no shit. Couldn't have figured that one out by myself, Phil. Now let it be known that I actually do like the songs in Tarzan. Well, some of them. Same goes for Brother Bear. Whether it's for nostalgia or I actually like them, it's up for you to decide. But I just don't like how they are used in the context of the story. Similar to another movie now that I think about it. To wrap this video up, let's discuss the critical response to this film to show you, dear viewer, just how incompetent critics are, in case you haven't paid attention to modern media in the last five years. Many critics said that this film, and I quote, Dave Kerr of the New York Times criticized the way in which the film portrayed Spirit and Little Creek as pure cliches, and suggested that the film could have benefited from a comic relief character. Shut the hell up. Because that's what we always need. We can't have a film that tries to take itself semi-seriously or tries to have some actual compelling characters. No, we have to have stupid fart jokes and pop culture references, otherwise those stupid kids won't like the movie. God forbid we actually give kids some credit and try to treat them with some kind of intelligence and respect. Heaven forbid we have a simple story because everything has to be overly convoluted and complicated to make everything seem really important. Well, guess what? You know what makes something impactful? Making it good. Which is what this film is. It's a gem that truly deserves more attention, and I'm not talking about that stupid remake they did, or that stupid Netflix show, because f*** those. That's the end of this video. I hope you all had a great day. Spank all those buttons and stay safe out there. Bye bye!